morning and welcome to Hamilton Road Presbyterian Church. It really is brilliant to see you. I really would love to see you sometime without all the masks on, but for now, it's just great to have you here. Um, if you're joining with us on the live stream, uh, we're delighted that you've been able to join with us today also. I'd like to make a few announcements before I hand over to Clara, who's going to lead our service for us this morning. Uh, we have a service here this evening uh, at 6.30, and we're continuing a series in 1 Samuel, uh, which by now has reached a point in the, the narrative where uh, the, the characters, the main characters are no longer Samuel and Saul, but David, uh, who you may know, King David, has come to the fore. So it'd be brilliant if you could come and join with us. Uh, I had a, a look this morning. Lots of people have already signed up uh, to be in the building with us, but there are still a number of spaces, so if you're quick, uh, you could get uh, a space for this evening's service. We have our first in-person Wednesday night prayer meeting this week, um, which we're very excited about, the first one of, of this year since early January. So please book yourself a seat in there. Uh, we'd love to have you with us. I should say, I've really enjoyed our midweek prayer gatherings in these early months of the year, even on Zoom. I've enjoyed them, so I'm looking, much, looking forward even more to gathering with you on Wednesday evening to pray. So please sign up and join us on Wednesday evening if you can. I should say at this point, our in-person meetings beyond Sundays are going to start to increase over the next few weeks, as the government restrictions are starting to ease, then the opportunities for people to gather here for uh, groups during the week, those are going to, to start up again. Uh, so keep an ear out for those. We're having a meeting this evening to work out what some of our next steps as a church family are going to be. So just keep an ear out and see if your fellowship group might be able to, to meet back in the building again soon. We've mentioned a few times over the last few weeks the United Appeal. Uh, we had that mission in Ireland service three weeks ago. Uh, the United Appeal is an opportunity to give to the, the mission of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. You hopefully have an envelope in, in your home, or if not, you could give uh, on church suite, and if you have any difficulty with either of those two methods, get in touch with us and we'll help you with that. We're going to have a storehouse collection in the church car park on Thursday the 29th over lunchtime between 1 and 2 p.m. The items especially needed this time around are tinned meats. So that's your chunky chicken, your stewed steak, your tinned curry and chili, stuff like that. But also jam and male and female deodorants and any of the usual non-perishable items. Uh, feel free to, to check all this on Church Suite announcements if you, you aren't remembering what I'm saying. It's with regret that we inform you of the death of uh, Robert or Bobby Wallace uh, from Seaview Nursing Home. Uh, he died on the 10th of April and his uh, funeral service was on Friday the 16th. So please keep Bobby's three daughters in your prayers. I said a moment ago that I'd be handing over to Clara, who'd be leading this morning's service. We're a church that takes God's word to heart here at Hamilton Road. So whenever God tells us in his word that he's given different people gifts and that he longs to see those people use those gifts to build each other up, then we take him at his word. And we love to see lots of people using their gifts to build us up in our church family. So this morning, I've invited Clara to use her gifts as she leads us uh, in our worship. I've been praying that God will use her and in, use her to encourage me and to encourage all of us this morning. Uh, Clara, please come and lead us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Whether you're here in the church building with us this morning or whether you're joining from home this morning or at a later part in the week, you're so welcome. Um, boys and girls, it's lovely to see lots of you here this morning too and I've loved watching you arrive with your families this morning. 
and I know that Amy is really excited to, to speak with you a little bit later in our service. Lots of us have had different sorts of weeks and maybe some of us feel a little bit fearful um, as we come today about what might lie ahead of us in the week that's to come. But I pray that whatever sort of week we've had, that God will bless us and encourage us this morning through his word, through us gathering together, through singing, through praying, um, and through what Christoph has to speak to us about later in the service. Let's join together in prayer. Lord God, creator of all things, we come to you this morning with thankfulness for all that you have done for us. We look around and have so many reasons to stop and to praise you for the beautiful creation that you have called into being so wonderfully displayed in the coastline where we live. Your creation speaks to us of your majesty and power and of your desire for us to enjoy good and beautiful things. We thank you for all that we have received through your son, Jesus, for the saving power of his death and resurrection and for the grace that sustains us and renews us each day. We thank you this morning for the privilege it is to gather together in this place with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for each member of our Hamilton Road family, from the youngest baby to the oldest member of our congregation and everyone else in between. Thank you that you have created each person in your image, and we praise you too that no two people are the same. As sinful people, we realize again this morning how much we need you. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we put our own needs before the needs of others. We confess that often our sinful desires and our selfish pride of considering ourselves better than others can lead to division and hurt and can take away from all the glory going to your son. We lay all of our sins at the foot of the cross thankful that we can experience life in all its fullness because of the death and the resurrection of your son. Help us to live in the light of your son's resurrection each day. Open our eyes and our hearts to the joy of your salvation as we behold you in all your glory. Amen. Some verses from Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. He who brings out the starry host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men fall. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Let's stand together now and let's sing, Behold our God. Come, let us adore him.
Good morning. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We've only been back a week. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning. Excellent. Now, I really need to try and get this mask off. I've got a new Madonna mic. Do you like it, guys? Isn't it very fashionable? I feel very trendy. Okay, so this morning, boys and girls, girls and boys, we are looking at the body of Christ. Sorry, Christoph. Spoilers. Okay, so I could have brought a skeleton up here or some kind of figure of a man, but instead, I decided to bring a game. Okay, so you all know that I love board games, but I also love games that maybe make me think a wee bit too, and not just Monopoly. But have you ever played chess, boys and girls? Hands up if you have ever played a game of chess in your life. Oh, a few at the back, excellent. One up there. A few grown-ups too, excellent. Grown-ups, you're involved too. Who's played chess? Excellent. Okay, hands up, boys and girls, if you've at least heard of the game of chess before, even if you haven't played it. Hands up if you've heard of the game. Grown-ups, you can do this too. Okay. Excellent. All right, so you all have a big, rough idea of what I'm talking about. So I brought my chess board with me this morning, and no joke, we did have a debate up here as to where some of the things went. And um, in the end, Google was brought in as the adjudicator. But it's all right. We are all set up and ready to go. Because you see, boys and girls, setting up a chessboard is quite difficult because all the pieces are different. They all have different rules and different purposes, so they all need to be in different squares and spaces on the board. Okay, so take, for instance, this wee guy here, okay? This wee guy here is called a what? A pawn, and I'm not just doing that because I don't know, I promise, okay? This is a pawn, and a pawn doesn't move all that much on a chessboard. It can go forwards one square, and it can go backwards one square. But pawns in their little movements are actually really, really important in the development of the game and in most defensive parts of chess, okay? They are a very, very important piece of the game, okay? And then, what shall we look at next? Oh, the biggest bit of debate this morning was around this guy here. Now, it's a horse. Anybody know what this one's called? The knight. The knight. Oh, you are all so enthusiastic this morning. It's brilliant, okay? This one's called the knight. Do you see how it's a horse? Do you see how it's a horse, everyone? Yeah? Yeah? So, a knight is an extremely odd piece on a chessboard. It goes in like L shape fashions, or J, as I was told it could be, but for me it's an L, okay? So it jumps forward three and over one, but it can jump over three and over one in any kind of direction, okay? So it's a very strange piece and doesn't move as you maybe would expect it to move. Oh, and then you have lots of other pieces. You have the queen as well. The queen can move forwards, backwards, diagonally, any which way she wants. Sounds about right, doesn't it? Okay. You have the king who moves one space at a time, but each of them have their own role on the chessboard, and each of them are really, really important. And boys and girls, this reminds me of us as the body of Christ. So we're told in the Bible that we are the body of Christ, and we all have a different role and purpose and gift within that body. And on the chessboard, all these pieces have different roles and responsibilities and different tactics and strategies used to help the overall aim of the game. And what is the aim of the game in chess? It's to pursue and capture the king, okay? You have your king piece on a chessboard, and that is what everyone is aiming to get. And aren't we the same, okay? When we are Christians, our aim is to pursue our king, who is the king of kings. And we all have a different role to play. Sometimes you may feel you're like, you're like a bishop and you are just shooting over really far diagonally, but then you actually go back a few squares and you might feel a wee bit bad. But you know what? It's all part of your pursuit of your king. You may feel like a pawn and you only move one step, but you're so important for our pursuit of the king. You may feel like you're moving so much like the queen and you actually need to slow down a wee bit, but you are important in our pursuit of the king. 
Boys and girls, if you do fancy maybe playing a game today, you can maybe make your own pieces out of, I don't know, like tins of whatever you have in the house and things like that. But I would really encourage you to set up a wee game of chess, especially because today isn't supposed to be as nice as yesterday. And have a wee look at just how many different ways these pieces can move across one board. One board, they all have the same rule. And I really hope that you remember that you can be any piece of this board game too because you have a really important role in our pursuit of the king too. Let's pray together really quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that when we believe to you, we belong to the body of Christ. God, that can be really difficult for us to understand, whether it's what is the concept of a body, whether it's our role in that body. And Father, we pray that as Christoph talks just today, as we go home and talk about it as a family, God, that you help us realize what our role in the body of Christ may be. We may be the hands, we may be the feet, we may be the pawn, we may be the bishop or the knight. God, help us to see what you would have us do here as we all pursue you in this life. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. So whip out your devices, everyone. It's Bible reading time, okay? So our Bible reading this morning is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31, okay? And Adrian and Emily Lester, or Adrian, sorry, my bad. Adrian is going to come up and share with us this morning. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Amen. Thanks, Adrian, for, for reading this morning. Before Christoph comes to, to preach from God's word, we're going to sing two songs. Um, the first is a song that we haven't had the chance to sing yet together. We sang it here um, as part of a live stream service um, maybe about a month or so ago. It's Who You Say I Am, and it, it talks about our identity in Christ as children of God. And the second song um, we're singing, it's a very prayerful song, one that we haven't sung here for quite a few years, but it ties in so well with what Christoph um, is sharing with us this morning. 
joined by the Spirit, washed in the blood, part of the body, the church of God, as we are gathered. So let's stand and sing those two songs together now. Take a seat and join with me as we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
This morning's sermon is the third in a series that we've called Picture This, Seeing the Church Through God's Eyes. It's not a a series that's been running weekly, so I'll have to remind you um, what we've looked at the last couple of months. What we're doing is we're coming to God's Word, looking at pictures that God has given us in the Bible of the church so that we can see the church the way that He does. Um, and aspire to be the kind of church that he wants us to be. In February, we saw that the church is the people of God. And we imagined that if, if we really understood ourselves that way here in Hamilton Road, that we would make God our absolute priority, and that increasingly we would worship God, we'd listen to God in his word, we'd talk to God in prayer, and we'd enjoy God. So those were some of the things that we said back then in January. In these early months that I've been in Hamilton Road, I've I've had a limited chance to interact with people. But the sense that I'm getting, the growing sense that I'm getting, is that there are a lot of people here who want to grow in their intimacy with God. And I'm delighted about that. I asked you right at the start of January, at the start of a new ministry, to be open to God. God's working in your life right now. And I sense sense that many of you are. In March, we moved on and we saw a second picture that the Bible gives us of the church. It's the family of God. And we said that any any church that's really growing as a family of God will, will want to do at least three things. It'll want to value people over institution. It'll want to be truly intergenerational. And we'll want to put an end to loneliness in our church family. Those are massive aspirations, aren't they? But it's exciting to come to God's Word, to allow God to show us what he wants us to be, and then to to put our hearts uh, to the task. We don't need to be mimicking megachurches around us or or parroting the, the latest published writer. All we need to do is come to God's Word with a, an open mind and heart. And then when God shows us what he wants us to be, pray for for the Spirit's wisdom and courage to put this into practice. Let me introduce the, the third uh, image of the church that I want to share with you in this story or in this series with a, an event from the early history of the church. So not long after Jesus had returned to heaven, groups of Christians began to spring up in first Jerusalem and then throughout Judea. And there was a man named Saul at the time who was dead set against these new Christian communities. So he traveled around them trying to have them arrested, dragged before the synagogues, and then thrown into jail. In Acts chapter 9, we read of what happened to Saul when he was on the road to Damascus, uh, traveling to imprison the Christians there. We read that a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the voice replied. Many of you will know that story, but I'm going to ask you again today to pause for a moment and reflect on it. Saul never met Jesus. And yet Jesus says that Saul is persecuting him. You see what Jesus is saying? Whenever you persecute my followers, you persecute me because my church is my body on earth. Here we have our third image of the the church. It's the body of Christ. It's maybe no surprise that Saul, who became the apostle Paul, is the New Testament author who writes most uh, about 
the, the church as the body of Christ because he's, he's heard the voice of Jesus speaking from heaven saying, this, this people that you're persecuting, this is my body that you're harming. There are a few passages where Paul refers to uh, the, the church as the body. I was going to have a crack at a few of them, but whenever I did my work this week, there was just too much. So we're just going to go to the one passage. 1 Corinthians 12, please have it open before you. The one that we have read, uh, Pauline and Adrian read for us a moment ago. <clears throat> we're going to begin in verse 12, but while you're locating that, so it's chapter 12, verse 12. Let me set the scene with a, a quick look at the first 11 verses. Paul's talking there about spiritual gifts, gifts which the Spirit of God gives to the, the people uh, of God, the body of Christ, so that they can build each other up. In verses 4 to 6, he, he establishes a, an interesting idea. Um, it, this is one of the places I could have gone a bit deeper and would have enjoyed it. He, he uses repetition to teach us that we're the same but different. Have a look quickly at 4 to 6. He says there are different gifts, but the same spirit, verse 3. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, verse 4. There are different kinds of working, but the same gods of work. You know that expression we use, we're the same but different? Well, Paul says that's how the church is. Our, our similarity and our commonality is built on Jesus. Our difference is in the diverse ways in which God's created us and gifted us. Whenever you get one end of that spectrum, or whenever you go to one end of that spectrum, the, when you overstress the unity that we're all the same and you forget that we're different, something goes missing. And the same, something goes missing when you say, yeah, we're all the same, we're all independent, we don't have that much in common, then a lot goes missing again. So, so what, what a, a mature Christian does is he pushes as hard as he can in both directions, explores the depths of our unity in Christ, and enjoys the, the diversity that God has given us, both of those two peers, uh, both of those two extremes. I love how Bono puts it in the U2 song, One. You might remember it from the 90s. We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other, carry each other, one. In a chapter where Paul is talking about the variety of gifts in the church, he, he, he only starts to talk about the body actually in verse 12. So that's where we're going to go now. He says, just as a body, the one has many parts all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. He uses the body metaphor, and he makes three important points that I want to share with you this morning. First, says Paul, since the church is the body of Christ, each part belongs. We see this particularly in verses 15 to 20. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. S stop for a second and think, what, what problem is Paul addressing here? Who's he talking to? Paul, Paul's writing to real people because he wants to correct real people. Miss, uh, miss ways of thinking about the church. People seem to be feeling that they're not part of the body. That seems to be a problem in, in the church in Corinth. Tell me this, is that possibly ever a problem in the church today? That we imagine we're not, not really a part of the church? It seems to me that it it's very much a likely possibility, isn't it? We might say, I'm not a gifted public teacher. I'm not a leader or a children's worker. I don't have any musical gifts. I'm not X, Y, or Z, and therefore, I don't have anything to offer, and I don't really belong. With a twinkle in his eye, Paul says, catch yourself on. 
What are you talking about? Just because you're not X, Y, or Z, you don't belong. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? You see what he's saying? If everyone were a public speaker, who'd have those quiet, prayerful, vital conversations in the pews before and after the service? If everyone were an upfront leader, who'd connect with the people at the back? We need way more than public speakers and upfront leaders in the church. God knows that, and that's why he's given us lots of different types of people with lots of different gifts. Look at verse 18. God knows what he's doing. In fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. So there it is. Our our first lesson about the body of Christ, each part belongs. If you're in Christ, you belong. As soon as Paul has persuaded the Corinthian readers that each part belongs to the body, he he pushes his argument a, a bit further, and he shows us in verses 21 to 26 that each part's equally important. It's a slightly different point. Look at verse 21. Paul says, The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Again, he's writing to real people. So what's the problem he's addressing? The problem he's addressing is this, that there must have been people in the church who imagined themselves more important than others. They thought they didn't need some of the folks who were part of the body in Corinth. Folks, I'm going to imagine that the the sins of Corinth aren't gone, that the same possibility exists among us here today, that we imagine that there are some people in the church who are just here to make up the numbers. As long as the important people are here, then it's okay. Okay. So long as we have a a minister who can preach, elders who can lead, good musicians and charismatic youth workers, then, then everything will be fine. As long as we have those important roles all filled, the other members of the church aren't that important. They're just spectators. They just come along. Paul challenges this idea that some members of the body are more important than others. On the contrary, he says, verse 22, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts that we think less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. A bit harder to know exactly what Paul is getting at here. I think Paul's inviting us to a a deeper and a wiser look at the church, to get past the superficial and to, to go much deeper. He's using this body metaphor to help us think deeply about the church and its members. I want you to think for a second about how your own understanding of the human body has developed over the years, okay? Think about how you thought about bodies when you were a child or a young person. You only noticed the visible attributes, those that made a body attractive. So whatever made a body tallest, do you remember in P1, you always wanted to know who was the tallest in the class? It was a fascination. Then you wanted to notice who was the strongest or the fastest. And soon you wanted to know who was the most beautiful. Everything about the external, how the body looks, But as we get older and as our knowledge of the body increases, we begin to appreciate some of the less visible attributes of the body, some of its absolutely vital organs that we can't even see. So we begin to appreciate lungs, which give us oxygen. 
We realize how much we rely on our hearts that pump that oxygen through our blood around our bodies. What would we do without our liver and our kidneys to, to purify and regulate our blood and to keep us healthy? These parts of the body, they're invisible. If I popped up full-size photographs of them on the PowerPoint, you'd turn away because they're not nice to look at. But they're absolutely crucial if we're to be healthy in our bodies. A wise person knows this. Using that body metaphor, Paul turns back to the church and he says, it's the hidden parts, it's the weaker, the less honorable, the unpresentable. They're indispensable. And we need to treat them with care. This is how God intends it. Verse 24, God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Any church that gives honor only to the visible and the strong is not at that point the church of Jesus Christ. I love where Paul takes his argument at this point. He's telling the Corinthians, yes, each part's important, but, but he explains why. Verse 25, so that there should be no division in the body and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Wow. Now that, that would be a beautiful body. No division. A place of equality and empathy. Who wouldn't want to be part of a community like that? So, Paul's shown us, using this body metaphor, First of all, that each part belongs. Secondly, that each part is equally important. And in the final part of our passage for today, verses 27 through to 31, he says, each part is gifted. Actually, this whole chapter, chapter 12, in, in one sense is all about gifting. The body part is used as a metaphor to explain the, the gifting point that Paul wants to make. Today we're going pretty fast through this long chapter, but I want you to notice that in chapter 12 as a whole, the Christian is gifted twice over in two ways. In the early verses of the chapter, Paul shows us how God's Spirit gives different people different gifts. But now in the closing verses of the chapter, he says that God gifts these people and their gifts to the church. Look at verse 28. God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. In the church of Jesus Christ, each person is given a gift by the Holy Spirit, and then each person is gifted to the church. We're gifted twice over we're gifted personally, and we're gifted to our community. Brothers and sisters, some of you are going to struggle with this, but I need to look you in the eye and tell you, if you're in Christ, you're gifted. Some of you have heard this kind of teaching for years, and you've said, yeah, there are gifted people in the church. I know lots of them but they're not me. And today I say, they are you. If you're in Christ, the Spirit's given you a gift. And he's gifted you to this church. And he wants you to use your gifts to bless your brothers and sisters here. Let's spend the last few minutes thinking about what would happen in Hamilton Road as we increasingly understood ourselves to be the family of God. Three, three things I want to say. First of all, we'd all play our part. Church would no longer be a spectator sport where a, a crowd of, of a large number of people show up to watch a small number of people play the game. We'd all be in the game, everyone getting to play. 
it's funny the language we use in, in churches. I think we have, to be, we have to learn to listen to our language and be careful about how we use it. So we might talk, for example, about the ministry team in a church. And by that, we often end up meaning the paid staff. So whenever this lockdown ends, I'm, I'm imagining that I'm going to eventually meet with ministers again. I haven't met any ministers for months um, but I'm going to meet with ministers again. They're going to know that I've moved to Hamilton Road, and they'll want to have a conversation with me. They'll ask me, how's it going? They'll ask me, what size is your ministry team? And I'll tell them, well, we have 12 people on paid staff, and they'll probably be a little bit envious because most ministers don't have 12 people on their paid staff. The thing is, I don't have a dozen people in my ministry team. I don't know the precise number yet. I'm, I'm working on this. But I think the number is somewhere over 800. You're saying, what do you mean, Christoph? How do you have 800 on your ministry team? Well, I had a look in church suite this week as I was preparing. We have 756 communicant members in this church. That means that at some point or other, those 756 people promised to give a fitting proportion of their time and talents. Sounds like using their gifts. Whatever gift God's given me, I'll, I'll use it. 756 people so far have promised to give a fitting proportion of their time and talents to serve God in the church. And I know that there are lots of people waiting in the wings to become communicant members of the church. That's where I get my number from. Over 800 people. Think about that for a second. What would it be like around here if 800 people understood that they've been gifted by God and were ready to use their gift in His service? <laughs> That's exciting, isn't it? I... I I have a limited imagination, so I can only see so far. It's going to take me years to, to work this out. Maybe, you, maybe the, all we need to do today is start thinking, what's my gift and where am I going to use it? Okay? That's, if, if nothing else today, that's your take-home homework question. What's my gift? How am I going to use it? I, I need to keep moving. If we understood ourselves truly to be the body of Christ, we'd all be equal. Paul talks about equality in the body in verse 25 when he says that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Equal concern, level playing field. Well, you might say, sure, we, we know that. We know that everybody's equal in the church. That's that's something we've always understood. Folks, it seems to me that while we say that the church is like lots of other communities that claims to practice equality, and that is that in the church, some people are more equal than others. Have you ever noticed how it's ministers and missionaries who get all the airtime around the church? They're the ones on our websites and notice boards they're the ones who have the articles in the church magazines. They're the ones we pray for. Ordinary church members can be left to feel like second-rate citizens by contrast. I'd like to see us eradicate any unhealthy and unbiblical hierarchy in our church family. It's something I've learned to be very committed to from one of my mentors, John Stott. In his 1992 book, The Contemporary Christian, John Stott says this, it's a wonderful privilege to be a missionary or a pastor if God calls us to it. But it's equally wonderful to be a Christian lawyer, industrialist, politician, manager, social worker, television script writer, journalist, or homemaker if God calls us to it. It's the hierarchy we must reject, the pyramid we must demolish. Isn't that brilliant? Let's do that here on Hamilton Road. Reject the hierarchy, 
demolish the pyramid, recognize for once and for all that we are equal, brothers and sisters in Christ. If we've understood ourselves to be the body of Christ in this place, we'll all play our part, we'll all be equal, and third, we'll all use our gifts. This is really what Paul's been getting at right through this chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, encouraging the members of the body of Christ to, to use their gifts to build each other up. We've got to do this. I imagine if I didn't use the, the gifts that God has given me in preaching or leading or whatever. You'd soon miss out because you're part of the body where I'm expected to use those gifts. If I'm not playing my part, you suffer and the whole body suffers along with you. Well, it's the same for me. When you don't use your gift, I miss out. And the whole body here along with me. Tell me this, why is it when God has given each one of us gifts in the church that we would ever settle for having one person or a small number of people exercise those gifts? I, I love it when Clara leads our service as she has today. She is a godly and a gifted woman. And she's used her gifts here today to bless me and I'm sure to bless you as well. God will do the same. He'll, he'll use other people to bless us as they bring their gifts and offer them for the building up of the body here at Hamilton Road. Folks, I need to be a bit frank with you. This needs a certain kind of a leadership style to lead a church in this way. If I allow other people to, to lead services and to preach and to share in my ministry in all kinds of ways, I'm taking a huge risk. There's a huge danger in this. Whisper it softly. What if they're better than me? Well, I grappled with that question many years ago, right at the start of my ministry. And with God's help, I quickly put it to bed. And I said, Lord, if you put people around me who are better than me, then I'll be delighted. I'll be so grateful. I'll, I'll receive them as a gift. Brothers and sisters who are going to build me up. And bless me. And bless the whole family that I'm a part of. Let me finish with a personal word to, to help you understand me. I don't want to try to lead this church with only my meager gifts. Because if I do, it'll kill me. And it'll kill this church too. This church needs far more gifts than I have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead it, hopefully something in, in line with the way God's Word's been leading us this morning. I'm going to encourage you, whoever you are, with whatever gift you have, to bring your gift. And we'll all use our gifts to build each other up in the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ in this place. Let's recognize that we're equal. Let's play our part. And let's use our gifts to build each other up for God's glory. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, 
Thank you for the encouragements and challenges we've received from your word this morning. We praise you that each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for your care and your creativity in shaping us as individuals and as a body of believers. As the local church here at Hamilton Road, we thank you for every single member of the body, each shaped by you. We ask that you would stir us afresh this morning to consider how each of us can play our part in the body of Christ in this place. Help us to look around and be so thankful for all of the different parts of the body, to rejoice as we watch others use their gifts and to celebrate how you are able to use us as weak, sinful people for your glory and for the building up of the church. Help us not to look at others and be jealous of their gifting, but to seek to work alongside each other, encouraging, complimenting, and spurring one another on as we each use different gifts for your glory. Help us always to strive to serve others and ultimately to serve you, and to always consider others as better than ourselves. I pray that as we do this, you will increase our joy and our delight in what it is to be children of God and members of the family here. This morning, Lord, we pray for those from our church family who have had a particularly difficult week. We bring to you those who have lost loved ones and remember the Wallace and the Smith families today. God of all comfort, by your spirit, draw near to them just now with your compassion and presence. For those who continue to wait for results of tests and scans or for further appointments with medical staff, grant those people your peace. For others going through treatment, whether at home or in hospital, sustain them each day with your strength and may the treatment be effective in the days and weeks to come. We pray for those we know who are in hospital today, from the very youngest up to the oldest. Be all that they need today and help to strengthen them and their families. We praise you for people you have gifted to be doctors and nurses who care for people in hospitals and in community settings. Bless them and encourage them. We thank you too for those from our church family who you have called to serve in different places in this world. And this morning we remember Sasha and Katty in Bosnia. We pray for them as their church family meets today and we ask that this body of believers will be lights in their community, sharing the hope that they have in Jesus. We praise you for how you have used online services from their church over this past year and pray for those who have been able to connect in this way. We ask, Lord, that these people will continue to seek after you and that they may soon be able to connect more in person with the church family and to gain more understanding of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Continue to bless Sasha and Ketty and all of those from our missions family as they serve you. Help us to build each other up your strength within us prove. Increase our faith, confirm our hope, and fill us with your love. Amen. Let's stand together now and sing those words together.
you're free this evening and you haven't booked in yet, book yourself a seat. Come back and join us at 6.30. In the meantime, I, I part you today with a, a benediction. Um, we, we use it when we pronounce a blessing uh, for our children at a baptism, but it, it's a, a blessing that Aaron spoke over the whole people of God, and today I want to speak it over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.